I want to thank the following sponsors of this podcast. I want to thank GoHunt.com, my friend Cody Nelson, the glassing guru. I call him the optics authority. He's the optics manager at GoHunt.com gear shop. Call Cody directly for any info or if you're looking to buy any type of optics at all at 702-847-8747. That's extension 2. You can also email him at optics at gohunt.com. Send him a text or call him on his cell phone at 602-399-3699. I want to thank Go Hunt for their sponsorship. also want to remind you it's application season. Uh, sign up for the Go Hunt Insider. If you're already not a member, you automatically get a $50 Go Hunt gift card just for signing up. Go to gohunt.com forward slash J Scott. Follow the prompt. Sign up for the Go Hunt Insider. I want to thank Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. I just did a podcast with Brendan Burns and Justin Schaefer of Kuyu about the new Velo pattern. Uh, it's their third camo pattern. It's a phenomenal pattern. If you haven't seen it, go to kuyu.com. That's K U I U.com. I want to thank Kuyu for their sponsorship. I also want to thank Phonescope.com. Use the JScott20 promo code. You're going to get a 10% discount on all orders. OnXMaps.com. Use the JScott20 promo code. You're going to get a 20% discount on all orders. That's the mapping software that I use. I use it for my real estate business, my hunting, my fishing, all of my outdoor activities. OnXMaps.com. Use the JScott20 promo code. And then Apex Ammunition. Go to apexmunition.com. It's the home of the TSS Tungsten Super Shot. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today I've got my friend Clay Bundy of Clay Bundy Outfitters on the line. Clay, how you doing? Really good. Thank you, Jay. Thanks for uh, letting me be part of this. Yeah, for sure. It's always great having you on. Uh, here we are. Uh, we've got a deadline, I believe, June 9th coming up. We're a couple weeks away, and I wanted to have you on to talk about the Arizona Strip. I've had you on the podcast quite a bit, and I encourage the listeners out there, if, if you're just tuning in, you're just uh, you know starting to listen to this podcast, check the back for the episodes I've had Clay Bundy on. Uh, a bunch, and I've been able to pick Clay's brain about the Arizona Strip. Um, Clay lives up on the Arizona Strip and born and raised and ranches right there and spends a lot of time up there not only uh, looking for deer but um, you know running his cows and and he has for his whole life so he's a huge resource uh, that I lean on to get my information for the Arizona Strip and uh, Clay with that being said um what do you think? How's this year shaping up? What, what's it looking like? Well, I'm kind of, I'm really excited about it. If you compare uh, this year to last year, which last year had, we had the great antler growth. We had a great spring last year. As far as moisture, we're, uh, we're a little bit ahead of what we had last year. Plus we had the end of November and December, yeah, November, December of last year, the strip got uh, the Arizona Strip got almost four to five inches of storm, and so that that made a lot of deep moisture. And and then we've had the good spring. We we need another storm coming up. But in the last couple uh, weeks, I've been from one end of the strip and back two or three times, uh, doing different helping different ranchers, doing different projects for the fish and game. Uh, and I'm telling you, the whole strip, as far as feed, uh, is better this year than it was last year. Um, as far as grass for cattle, but also for, for uh, brush and browse for, for deer and antelope, it's just a phenomenal year. Uh, perhaps the only thing I wonder and worry is whether we have enough age class deer to make that, you know, to, uh, deer have got the, the, the biggest the giant bucks, right? We've got to have the age also to go with the moisture to make the, the great year. But, um, it, it's pretty exciting to me. I, you know, we got us some of the records back of the 
uh, the age of the deer we killed last year and uh you know that that big deer of shane rotens that we killed was a five-year-old deer wow and so to me that is just really really exciting because uh there's a lot of four year four year old deer that could just really explode this year. So kind of your, your your point with that is it's five years old, meaning it's not really that old, and he's an absolute giant, right? I mean, and so yes. there's a lot of four year old deer that you know about that you're thinking potentially, if Shane's was five and just blew up, could there's four year old deer that you know about that could potentially do the same thing, whereas like. Normally, we're talking about we need those deer to get, you know, six, seven, eight years old in order to be just mega giants. You're saying that, you know, the, the genetics are so good on the strip that, you know, a five-year-old deer could be just an absolute gagger. Yes. Um, two of the better deer we killed were five. A lot of the others were, were you know, six, eight, six, eight years old, which, you know, that age is so important, but... Uh, but it also is exciting to see that some of these young deer can also blossom and you know on a good year and and be giants you so, know jumping back to something you had said about the forecast um, when you were talking about the amount of moisture and getting that late uh, fall moisture in the ground and you said it you know it, it went deep and then you throw on the top of, of you know great spring moisture that we've had and then you talk about, you know, you worry a little bit about age class potentially from just a year, you know, a, a moisture standpoint and and throw out the age class of deer, you know, going back, you know, 20, 30 years. Do you think that this year stacks up just as far as moisture wise and timing of moisture as good as it, as any any year you've thought of, you know, like 2010 you know, that, that one comes to my mind. Is is this as good as any year you've seen, or is it just definitely one of the better ones you've seen? I think it's uh, it's uh, it's better in the fact that we had that November, December storm. I mean, we just don't hardly ever get that kind of a, a five-inch, you know, in five inches of the storm in a couple months in the winter where, where it doesn't run off it all goes into the ground i mean w we're better off this year than moisture wise than we've been for i, I almost think probably bef better than 10 i mean in 2005 we had an incredible spring and and that was also a good deer year uh but so i think that as far as moisture goes where uh, it's as good as year as, as we can hope for. You know, last year we did get s some good storms in M May and June. Uh, and so I think we need that to keep the deer going. But as far as a start and a, I mean, it's, it's, it's like I say, I've been all into the strip the last few days or weeks and it's just some, and to end, it's just, it's just absolutely beautiful out there. What about catch water as far as tanks? Um, is is are the tanks all full? Or are, are tanks that are usually dry this time of year are they full? What what's the tank water situation like? Okay, all the wildlife catchments and the man-made uh, catchments, not dirt ponds, but all all the the other ones, the the wildlife catchments and the the big cow catchments that catch water off of small areas they're they're all full the dirt tanks see last summer as you remember we had we had the or last year we had the great spring and then just a horrible monsoon oh yeah horrible monsoon and so a lot of the dirt tanks don't have water um which um which will congregate the deer a little bit right now but i feel like they're gonna, we're going to get some monsoons which or i hope we need to get them right. or we'll be in trouble as far as as far as cows but um so there is a lot of dirt tanks that are dry 
but as far as uh, so as far as the catchments, they're all full. Yeah. Historically, <laughs> historically, um, the dirt tanks fill up in the monsoon, and what you're saying is we had a bad mon- monsoon last year. So actually, for for catch water for dirt tanks catching water, they actually didn't catch, so they're still dry. But historically, yep. those tanks in those big monsoon rains, that's when the catch water, you know, the, the the dirt tanks fill up, right? Yes, that's how it works. So going into, you know, the guys out there that are thinking about the archery hunt with uh, a, a bad monsoon last year and dirt, a lot of dirt tanks being dry, it did force those deer to those um, came and fished uh, water catchments. In your opinion, if we just have a pretty darn good monsoon, which is going to run some water and fill up some dirt tanks, now you add dirt tanks with water and you add catchments with water, you're going to have, and you have widespread feed, you're going to spread those deer out if, if we can get some monsoon. Would you agree? Yes, I would agree with that. And, uh, you know, as far as right now the deer are hardly even hitting water they're they're, they're going to start but there's still enough moisture in the feed that they're they're not there's some deer i believe that haven't even drunk yet since okay. uh since last you know since they stopped in the winter and maybe some people may not agree with me on this but i i'm pretty sure that there's deer that do not drink much all winter long they just get the moisture from the uh from the what they're eating yeah um from a grazing standpoint out there on the arizona strip in years like this where there is good you know winter and spring moisture and you've got that good feed widespread out there um just from a little historical background is it a function where guys that like yourself that are running cattle on the arizona strip is there a point where you actually bring in more cattle on years like this or are most of the operations, you know, cow calf operations where you kind of have the same amount and number of cows and, and, you know, they're just fatter. They don't have to go as far for feed and, you know, walk as far for water and and what have you, or are there times when, you know, stalker cattle come in and and they really load up on the Arizona strip? That was a question I've, I've actually been meaning to ask you. Yeah. So the, basically on the Arizona Strip, everybody has a cow-calf operation, and so they don't bring a bunch of steers in when it's really good. Uh, and so, you know, we kind of, uh, you know, there's good years and there's bad years, and, and cows, they'll eat dry feed. I mean, they don't do as good, but so we kind of, on these good years, we bank it, you know what I mean, and, uh, and save it, you know, and, and most most ranchers have a uh, you know most of the land out there is federal land or or state and you know and so we uh we are kind of told how many we really can run there and so we not a lot of cattle come in there more than normal it's it's pretty uh it is what it is so uh, yeah and, and so in other words with with that question it leads to my point of on these good years where you do have widespread feed all over, those cattle kind of spread out just like the deer as well. And so it's not like you're bringing in a bunch of cattle and really hammering it when it's good. It, it is what it is. And you've, you know, your animal units per acre are kind of set in stone. And so, you know, if we do have good monsoon moisture, all of a sudden we've got widespread feed all over. The cattle are doing good and the deer are doing good. And it's not a situation where, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we could bring in thousands and thousands of stalkers and all of a sudden eat that feed off. It is what it is. That's what I was trying to get at. Yes, and that's exactly what it is. Um, It just, you know, for when the, um, when the feed's good, everything's good, though. You know, the cattle bull back up quicker, the deer do better. They, they have two fawns. They have they can milk two fawns. It just, uh, it just makes for incredible uh, odds for the animals. You know, they just do better. Everything's better. And uh, I, I look for four years from last year and four years from this year of being a bunch of really big deer because of 
of all the fawns that are going to that were born last year and, th and this coming year you know um just because of of the good year sure and and no we you know it doesn't get all eaten off be, uh, with cows because it's the same number re almost regardless i mean we get cut sometimes when it's really really bad but we really don't our numbers of cows have been the same for the last 40 years yeah all right so looking forward um and these guys that are listening wanting to hear about the conditions you've covered that and now we start looking forward to you know you've got archery hunts on the strip in 13a 13b and you've got rifle hunts in 13a and 13b uh and v pretty few tag numbers of archery hunts and i, I looked on gohunt.com earlier and just did a little stat check and it looked like um for residents uh for 13a for archery uh it was uh 13 points to be guaranteed and for b it looked like 17 points uh for archery and then of course for the non-resident it it pretty much max point holders for uh for the non-residents there interestingly there are uh 23 is max points for deer three of those people uh or excuse 23 points there's 110 total people with max points three of them are residents 107 are non-residents and you drop down to 22 points there's four residents with 22 119 with uh, non-residents 21 points there's 11 residents 161 non-residents and then you've got 20 uh, point uh, total you've got 30 residents and 208 non-residents um, i actually sit in the 19 point pool which is i i didn't even run the numbers on that but um you know it's funny to me it, it's interesting to me let's say that there was a time when I believe 13A, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe 13B was an over-the-counter archery hunt in August, and ironically, it was not even a very sought-after tag. Um, can you speak to that as far as, I mean... Yeah, so it, it was only 13A, though. Okay. 13B wasn't open. Okay. Uh, and uh, you're right. It, it was more just it wasn't really serious archer hunters. It was just people wanted to go out there and kill a buck. And, and there was a lot of little deer got killed. Uh, Do you actually I, think the, the draw putting it in archery deer as a draw, do you actually think now less deer get killed and the deer that do get killed are usually fairly mature? And so now it actually helps rather than before when it was just guys going out and sitting and probably shooting two points. Do you think that the, the amount of deer that were shot pre-draw, if you will, had much effect on the quality in A or not really? No, I do. I really believe it has. It, it, was, it was bad that way because a lot of little bucks got killed. And they never, so you're right. Right now there's less deer get killed at, and they're older class. And so it does, it, it's helped 13A. It really has since they changed it. When you look at 13A and 13B, we've talked about this before. Um, describe 13A a little bit um, and compare it to 13B and kind of play back and forth on them from an aspect of, you know, getting around, traveling around, road structure, you know, size of unit, densities. Just kind of compare, if you will, um, okay. the, the both of the units. Okay, everybody that calls me and has put in for years, they, they always say they only put in for 13B. 13B is, is a bigger unit, and almost the entire unit, there's deer in you can really find a deer almost anywhere on the unit. Uh, 13A is a little smaller and, and a good, I wouldn't say half, but almost three eighths of it is probably big, wide open, like antelope country. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's 
it's it's a giant landmass, but it's smaller because of so much of it. There's a lot of it that's not deer country, uh, and then also part of 13A borders the the park, the Grand Canyon National Park, uh, and and B does also, but it follows right on the river where on 13A part of the park comes up right into really good deer country and so a lot of those some of them deer can get into the park and get away from you um again everybody that i I swear everybody that calls me that has put in for long has always put in for 13b um and it's interesting it's just that it's been the been the place um I myself, I always put in for both, uh, just because I've I've grown up there and I know that there's great deer on A and there's great deer on B. Uh, the some of the deer on well, interesting that the deer or the the season this year are the same as they were last year. B is early in the rifle, and A is late, and that's the way it always was for years, and then a then a, a few years ago they they went back and forth but i think now it's going to be go back to 13b is early which is going to uh i don't know it, it'll make people wonder what to do uh some of the deer on a in the rut will drop off onto b there's a lot of deer do uh and so you know, for archery, I think A is a great choice uh, because a lot of them deer are, are still up on B or up on A. And B, I mean, I mean for rifle, it's it's still a good choice in my opinion because uh, because it's going to be later. It's going to be more in the rut. Uh, Historically, Clay. You know, you talk about the years when A and B flip flops, and now you're saying it's kind of, you know, it's going to do the same as last year, where um, B is first, A is second. What you're saying is A is a little bit smaller unit. Sometimes a lot of the deer, not a lot of the deer, but some of the deer from A go to B during the rut. Um, so maybe those bucks that you would be thinking about hunting, you got to watch that they won't drop off and and go into B. Um, because the a hunt is later it kind of creates a situation where a guy like yourself it kind of puts a little pickle because if you just had to if you if you had the same hunt dates you would probably say b is is your top choice because of deer from head to toe maybe it spreads people out but then you throw in the fact that a is later dates and potentially could be we've seen you know you've seen years widespread where a they're just everywhere you go they're rutting and that's a pretty enjoyable experience so i think the hard part for someone like you is trying to convey to people that and i think it would be the headache of any guide on the arizona strip of there's some great deer in a and there's obviously great deer in B. It's just trying to decide if you want to, from a rifle hunting standpoint, if you want to, A, if you're looking for more of that rutting experience where you're going to pretty much be able to go and widespread see deer rutting, or if you're just ultimately looking for the absolute best deer, one of the challenges with A, correct me if I'm wrong, is that because of the kind of more smaller or more dense densely um in a in a smaller dense area it are the bucks in a you kind of get a little bit more pressure also in a because you're kind of in a little you're pigeonholed a little bit in a smaller area is that true too that is true uh, you know there's there's 80 tags in b and 50 in a which that that's good too uh you know so so it makes A look really good. But then it's it's like, you know, and I've talked to you about this before, a lot it doesn't matter um which unit you're in, the best couple bucks are gonna have twenty or thirty of those tags hunting them. 
Right. You know, and so to be honest, last year we had less pressure on A, less competition on A than we did B. Um, one, and, uh, one question but, I would have is on good years like what we have right now, when the deer are potentially spread out, would you say that that fares better for A hunters or B hunters, if you know what I'm saying? Whereas if you were saying, well, it's a dry year, so A may be better or B may be better, in a potential year where you've got widespread uh, vegetation, you know, feed throughout, does that play into any factor of, well, it, it kind of makes A a little better, or oh, it makes B a little better in, in a situation like what we've got, you know? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. I have never thought of that. Um, Leave it to me to give, give you something you've never <laughs> thought of. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what would be the best on which unit on a situation like that. Um, what about as far as deer traveling? Um, do you feel like widespread vegetation, you know, good feed throughout the unit from head to toe, does that make them travel less or more? Um, or do you think it's just individual deer? It doesn't matter. They're going to travel regardless or no, there's more vegetation. So they're actually going to stay a little more home and stay a little more put, um, than, than just, you know, going on walkabouts. Yeah. You know, they, they will, uh, it's interesting this year I've, uh, in the winter I've noticed more deer in lower countries um, not really down in the deep, deep canyons, but just kind of right out in the middle of stuff. Um, and I don't know really wh why that was, whether there, it was the feed started there sooner. And so they were there or, or, uh, or what, but, uh I lost my train of thought. Ask me that question one more time. Sorry. Well, I guess my point is like you talk about seeing deer in places that you haven't seen. Oh. Maybe that plays into the fact that there's feed there that normally isn't there and that those <laughs> November and December rains created situations or snows um, created a situation where maybe there's some feed there that normally there isn't. So they've, you know, they kind of travel around and all of a sudden there's some feed there. So maybe they stick out and they're, they're kind of staying in a couple of those places where you don't normally see them. That, that's, prob that's exactly kind of what I've seen. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's talk about some of the deer that you shot last year. And then you mentioned that the only thing in the back of your mind that just has you thinking a little bit is worried a little bit about age class it seems like every year that's always a little bit of a worry of yours and others you know you're always hoping that that age class can come through um talk a little bit about that as far as you know where we're at age class yeah. wise from bucks that you <clears throat> shot last year and you know bucks you know about and that that so every time I get with a, a game warden and I know these game wardens up here really well. And they're really good game wardens. Um, Luke Thompson, uh, shirt left. I mean, every time I'm with them, I, this is what I always say is we've got to keep the numbers down. We've got to keep the numbers down to get that age class so that we can have these big deer to hunt. And, and I really, that is so critical. I mean, and just, and, and a minute ago I said, you know, the deer was only five years old, you know, and he's big. Well, in most States, five-year-olds are old deer because nothing can get that old because they get shot when they're babies. Uh, and so Arizona does a great job of, or on the strip they do anyway, of keeping that age class. And that's so critical. Um, and yes, so most of these big deer that we killed or, or, well, everything we killed was five and up last year. Um, 
well, maybe except one. And so it is so critical to have that age um, to have big deer. Do you think the holdover bucks, I mean, from other deer, not only the deer you guys killed, I mean, do you think that it's going to just be... I mean, are you truly worried about the age class? Like, man, a bunch of big deer got killed, or do you know there's a lot of really good deer that are up and coming? You know, I, it, it's always a worry for me for the, for the giant deer, but for, um, you know, for the regular hunt, it's, uh, I, I am not worried. I, I believe that there's a, there was enough left over um, that there's going to be some big deer, uh, because I mean, there, there were just, there was, so last year there was plenty of big deer. And so there was a lot of these younger deer that, that didn't get shot that, that are going to have a chance to Gene, be come big get this year. Poppy. I feel. Let's talk about the archery hunt. Um, bounce back to the archery hunt on A and the archery hunt on B. Um, y- y- you talk about the, you know, archery is tough as it is. Most of the guys are either spotting and stalking or sitting water. Um, in your opinion, is is the the hunt on A for archery better than the hunt on B, or is the hunt on B for archery better? Or are they perfectly equal in your mind? I, I I think they're pretty dang close. I mean, on on for the A and archery, uh, there's a lot of lot of deer summer on A. Uh, a lot of bucks, and so I think I would I wouldn't have a, a minute's thought about either one of them, either thirteen A or B. They're both great archery tags in so my opinion it wouldn't surprise you if a bigger buck came off of a on the archery hunt than b it, that wouldn't surprise you at all no it wouldn't at all on the flip side of that taking the rifle talking about a and b there although there are big deer on a you probably would bet that a, the biggest deer of all on the rifle hunts will come off of b or is that is that assuming too much uh i thought maybe for an average because there's going to be more but uh in in my in our inventory uh there's the top some of the top deer that made it are on a this year okay but then you also throw in the factor when you're trying to decide whether you do a or b um what you said earlier about some of these four-year-old deer that all of a sudden could blow up and you know be like the deer that Shane killed last year or some of these deer that you never know and that's the exciting part right of of knowing the genetic potential of a and b is that you know the four-year-old deer that you know about they are five this year and all of a sudden could just blow up into some mega giant yes and so that's why maybe b that's why b so calling to everybody is because you know there is going to be there's more deer there there's there's a there's a there's a chance there's a probably a, a better chance of something that someone a, a young deer showing up that could explode yes you know and that's what's so you know i i'm kind of goofy but i when i see a young young buck with deep tines and just a little bitty thing i think I, I, I want to see him in a couple of years that thing you know if he's got the the just the look and the, you know but he's you know pencil thin and he but he's got the deep forks and oh Deep forks, I mean, that's kind of where you want to start, right? With a deer, if you see a young deer, what you want to look for is a deep fork deer because you know mass will come on most deer and length will come, but you've got to have those deep forks in order to have those big scoring, you know, boxy big deer, right? Yeah. Uh, That's what 
exciting when you see little ones like that, you know. Yeah. Clay, do you think, you know, there's been all this talk about trail cameras and, you know, do you think in your mind, I mean, I think you'll agree that uh, trail cameras have allowed guys to really inventory deer, but there is an argument out there that actually the amount of cameras and the amount of intel and information that's out there has actually allowed a lot of deer to grow up because outfitters may have shot a deer, but they know there's another deer or two right in that same area that are bigger. So they actually have held off on some deer and not shot them. I know there's some guys that are arguing that, you know, true, you know, guys that are really looking for trophy deer, that trail cameras have actually, in a way, helped that. What's your thoughts on that? I mean, do you see some positives in in having the intel and, and that information to be able to say, hey, that's a phenomenal deer, but if we just keep pounding around here for a day or two, we're going to find this other one? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, if the trail cameras are gone, and and I'm and I've got my own opinion on that, but if they're gone, we will start shooting lesser deer. There's no question, uh, and it it does it does help the age class. Okay, so you are in the you are in the corner of. One real positive thing about trail cameras is it allows great inventory to be taken of deer and it allows you as an outfitter to say, hey, you know, that's a really good buck, but I, I know we can probably get a yep. bi bigger buck than that. And then all of a sudden, you know, that deer that you passed this year all of a sudden becomes that, you know, big giant deer that everyone wants. Yes. Now, <laughs> <laughs> I knew you. I knew you were going to throw a now in there. Let's let's hear it. Okay. The only problem I have with with trail cameras, which I would like them gone, is because of the dishonesty of people. How the, so? Because they get stolen. They get the card stolen. You know, we're supposedly sportsman <laughs> right what a misconception right so and, so is your concept that it's gotten so competitive that the idea of ethics and sportsmen and people's own desire to 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 move forward in their own whatever ego has created yeah. a situation that is almost out of control from a standpoint of you know, you almost start questioning your, you know, fellow sportsman. That's what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. As far as, as far as having a, there's, there's nothing cooler than, than uh, putting up a camera and coming back and seeing this giant deer. And you learn so much from, from looking at the cameras and when they come in and it just, it's just so much information that is so cool and valuable. Uh, I love them. But it, it is it is just so frustrating. It definitely brings out the nasty side of human yeah. beings, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So in your opinion, if they went away, it wouldn't bother you one bit. Like you would just, you're, it's not like you're out there saying we need to go, make them go away. But if they did, you would say, fine, that, that's perfectly yeah. fine with you. Yeah, and I, I want them either left alone or I want them completely gone. I don't want a season. Okay. A season is, is just going to make it uh, worse Make it worse because your, your information then is more valuable because you have such a short time to get it. Yeah. I think it, it'll cause worse. It'll make, it'll make outfitter against outfitter because we're, uh, people are going to be cheating and, and we're, and we're going to be telling on each other. It's, it's, it's not going to be good at all. So I either want them left alone or get rid of them. Yeah. But. Well, okay. That's, I mean, you've been out there long enough. I think your opinion is very, very valid. And, you know, it, there's a lot of weight that should be put behind it because of the amount of time that you spent out there and, the, you know, out there 
probably <laughs> more than anyone else out there just because you run cows out there and you're, you're you live out there i mean you're out there all the time so i mean you see well yeah and i i uh you know we run cows i i work out there for other ranchers i i mean i've been out there all week i've just that's just where i go <laughs> yeah. that's my life so. what what is the lion situation um looking like and with the ability to monitor trail cameras do you feel like the lion population is stable do you think it's way over you know over there's too many or do you think it's in good check i i would like to see more pressure put on the lions um i just got a text from uh uh, Gavin Heaton from the Bar 10 Ranch that's down in the bottom of Whitmore Canyon and there was a on their front lawn there was a lion there last week they got a picture of it <laughs> really yeah and uh, so predators is if we, if we just keep putting pressure on them it will help the deer herd not only the lions, the coyotes, you know, and a lot of people like this year are saying, well, coyote hunters, well, we don't see any coyotes. There's not that many coyotes. But interesting this year, and I think it was because of, you know, we didn't get any good monsoons last year. And so the rabbit population was down. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we lost... Uh, we lost three calves to coyote, and I rode up on a cow. The calf was, and a coyote was running off, and the calf was ha half eaten mm. uh, this year. And so we've had we've had more coyote problems this year, I think, than uh, than in the past. Uh, and the, those coyotes are hard on hard on fawns, you know. Yeah. Uh, so predators, we always need to keep working on them. Yeah, keep them in check. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the deer that you guys, I know we did a podcast on it, so I, for the people that didn't listen to that podcast, you guys shot some fantastic deer uh, last year, and I think it all started out with, um, I think there was a big raffle buck you guys were involved with, and then Shane's deer, uh, the the big auction deer, I believe, uh, and then the general season. So talk a little bit about those deer. Yeah, so we, it was incredible. Um, for Cliff Finley had the through the raffle tag, and we had a we had a buck that. Uh, Hit, hit a one camera uh, early, and you could tell he might be good, but not you didn't know that much about him. And then um, out uh, glassing the one morning, I was out with my friend and uh, and uh, seen this buck and got a tr just tremendous video. And and then we didn't see him again for three weeks, even a month. And I I looked hard. Cause he looked like he was really going to grow and, and, and he never hit a camera. Just, we just didn't get him. And, uh, and then, uh, there was another buck that was a really good deer right there that we ended up killing during the general season. We kept seeing him and he was tremendous. We almost wanted to shoot him with the rifle. And, uh, and anyway, so we ended up, uh, having Cliff come and, uh, just <laughs> just had a tremendous hunt with him and, and uh, this deer was we got him killed and he was like 35 wide just so much mass uh, ended up scoring like 258 in the velvet <laughs> just, just a classic just the coolest buck uh, and then we, then we went from there we had a archery hunter and uh and had a just a fantastic hunt with rich uh stewart and he he was um we had this group of bucks all to ourselves and uh 
never seen another hunter on him all, at all. And uh, he made a great shot. The buck was a 220, what, I can't remember. <laughs> that was a big, wide, big frame yeah. deer, right? Yeah. What was fun, when I, I seen that deer, he was with a big old bunch of bucks, and he was a late grower. And I remember Vinny would come back and telling everybody, and I says, uh, telling Parker and Talon, and I says, no, this beer, deer's not as grown out, but he's going to be better than the rest of them. And, and he, he turned out that way. He he really grew and was uh, just a big old frame deer. Uh, we got a lot of cool footage of him. Was that an A or B deer? It was a B deer. Okay, B deer. So that was the archery season, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we, we had some other archery hunters, uh, on a, uh, and got some, got some shots and we're on big deer every day. In fact, we, we ended up killing the one we were hunting during the rifle on a, but so then we went, uh, and we had, we was able to get the auction tag with Shane Roten and, you know, and we were hoping to kill that big deer, that big wide deer that Mike Gallo killed. And, of course, we didn't get a chance to hunt him because he was killed before we could start. But so we were back and forth and trying to find a big deer. And there was some. But, and then, interesting, when I was hunting antelope, I had uh, jumped a deer and I didn't get a good look at him. They're right out in the open in the antelope country. And uh, a couple weeks later, I went back in there and and glassed up and found. I think I found the buck that I had seen, and it, but with him was this giant buck that we killed with Shane. And uh, it was just a a great thing too. It was a big old wide 270 inch deer Jeez. uh and he was just he was maybe two days after uh three days after stripping his velvet just real wide and, antlers wasn't he yeah he was white and the tip everything was just pencil sharp you know mm -hmm. and uh so that was just incredible uh and then we went from there to our or rifle hunts, or, or general hunts, and, uh, you know, opening morning, uh, I I was with uh, Greg Krogh, which what an honor to be able to have hunted with him, and uh, and his friend Jim Cass, and, I mean, we were, we were with about 40 other tags trying to kill uh, the same buck, and, uh, and it got killed by someone else, and but we there were some other ones there, and anyway, we was able to kill uh, Greg Krogh's buck, and uh, God, what a buck! buck. Mass yeah. man, it, just as big a deer dead as I've ever seen. Uh, you know, and that, and I've kind of seen a couple big ones. You know what I mean? But he, <laughs> he. This dad holding him, he's just so giant. And and you're not saying necessarily top end score. You're just saying overall frame, just giant, massive frame deer, is yeah. like as big as they get. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I'm going to say something stupid. I'm going to say he's only like 230. You know, but holy cow, that's stupid to say. Right. I mean, 230 is giant. Yeah. But uh, just so big. Yeah. It was just. Just cooler, and then, and then uh, we. Uh, I I was also taking that Jim Cass, and we got to go uh, clear down. We drove for two or three hours and got clear down in the area, and and was able to kill his buck. And you know, it was fun with him. Is he's from uh, oh, Wisconsin, and. He never shot his gun over 200 yards. And, uh, 
but he had the, the gun had the capability and he uh he believed in me and we 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 got within 500 yards you know and he we got him set down and got a perfect rest and and he killed the buck and just a cool buck and something interesting about that buck the buck from where he was in the summer and this is not typical for the strip but he went 28 miles wow where we killed him that's some of the cool things about being there locally and and yeah that's one of the cool things about trail cameras and being able to monitor and then being able to kill him and be like yeah he's 28 miles point to point from where you know where we had him to where he died yeah and then you know uh we another client we had randy perkins uh he uh a few years ago he had an a tag and we killed a, a 202 buck with him and and we were hunting we were hunting the buck that was with uh cliff's buck or, or in that same area well there was four or five different outfitters that just pounded that area i mean spotlight and all night it was it was a circus and uh persistence paid off my guys uh you know just kept at it and uh and basically the reason we got him killed is because we had people in the right places and was able to after the deer got shot out was able to locate you know get on him and and interesting randy could make is on the opposite of jim cass randy could make comfortably a thousand yard shot and he shot the deer at uh, about 50 yards <laughs> uh, it's funny how that works <laughs> yeah but it, what a what a effort by my guides and that's what i want to really stress here is you know everybody calls me oh, i just want to book with you well let me tell you what i've got i've got tremendous guides that don't just come for the hunt these guys scout with me you know they're my brothers or my nephew my you know these young guys that help me that are just they don't just come for the hunt they're there setting cameras with me doing it all i mean so much effort and so that's what's hard is everybody's trained to ask the question can i go with the outfitter you know I get, I get the same thing. I know exactly what you're talking about. And so, but I, but I guess what I really want to stress is I got tremendous guys that know the strip as well as I know it, you know, and, and all the information, we all have that same information. And so I, you're going to have just as good as experience with my guides as you are with me, in my opinion. Yeah, and that's one of the things that makes it nice for um, someone like you that is the outfitter, but it's nice to have guys that you can trust that work for you and you're all working for the common good and, you know, have that ability to have guys that you can lean on that you know are really, really good. And, you know, yep. having, you know, like I always say, I'm like, hey, I know you want to go with me, but I'm telling you, my guides, they're they're – I think they're better than me. And I tell, I tell people that all the time. I'm like, my guides are phenomenal. Like I, I, I mean, I know you want to go with me, but I think you're better off going with them. And I'm not saying that's the case, but, but no, that's the truth. I, I mean, mean, that's, you want to say, you're like, gosh, you know, they're, I wouldn't have them around if they, they're phenomenal. Like that's why they're here. Yeah. But well, that's awesome. Um, yeah, you guys. So then, then, one more story. We then we went. We, we killed a couple more in in B that were just old bucks, good bucks, not high scoring, but they were just cool bucks. And uh, and then we went to A, and uh, um, we had uh, we killed a great deer up there. Just that buck we called Slow Mo that was just an eighty year old guy. Uh, 
got to shoot it and uh it was it was pretty sweet so we just we had a tremendous year which that just makes my heart or my stomach churn for this year because expectations uh we got to perform um but i believe we can do it i mean i we got the team to do it and uh anyway that's awesome you know i know it's always hard when you it's phenomenal to have kind of things go kind of in line and exactly how you want them to go it's hard to follow up years like that because what, exactly what you're saying you're pressing you're trying so hard to do and and match what you did last year and one of the things i like to tell people is i, I want to be judged on a 30 or 40 year career and yeah. if, if you you know, you push hard, you always push hard, but you, you know, you, you can't always perform like you did the year before. You always try to, and you all, you know, you always try and just better and better and better. But the reality is I want to be judged on a 30 or 40 year career. How did I do over a long period of time? Not how did I do this year or last year or next year? It's like, how did I do year in and year out? And that's one thing about you. Um, you know, there's always big bucks hitting the ground around you and you just got to continue to do what you love and follow your passion and, you know, just do the best you can. And, you know, like we, we always say, you know, some years the sun shines on you and some, yeah. some days it shines on you and some days it doesn't. It's just the way it is. But you know, all you can do over a course of over the course of time is do the best you can, go at it as hard as you can, and then be judged not by one year because everyone has a banner year. Yes. Be judged on the course of history of you know a long period of time. How did I do for thirty or forty years? And you know, everyone's going to have their day in the sun and have the bright shining year, and you know kill a big ram, kill a big buck, kill a big bull, and just you're on fire. But, you know, can you sustain that for, you know, I look at yeah. it like, can you st sustain it for at least 20 years? You know, guys that do it three or four years, great. Hats off to them. But, you know, the guys that do it for 20 plus years, to me, that's the true test of, you know, how good is someone at what they do. Yeah. And that's what I keep telling my guys, too, is like, you know, we just got to keep working hard and and i've i've had years where we haven't done that well and it's it's it hurts it's not it's not any fun and so we got to just just keep working hard and uh, i mean you got to have you got to be lucky or blessed i call it blessed you got to be blessed to be in the right place the right time see the right thing um well, and good things happen to good people too. I mean, I'm I'm confident of that. I mean, I know there's times when things happen in life, and you think, "Golly, that that guy's you know he's pretty sorry, dude, and he's got things going that are you know out of this world." And it just seems like always things come around, and you know, good things happen to good people. And um, Clay, it's always awesome having you on the podcast. I appreciate your knowledge, and it's just. Uh, uh, a joy to have you on and be a friend of yours and it was great to see you at the salt lake uh, expo and i'm glad you're healthy and safe and yep. uh, just uh, look forward to prosperity uh this year with uh cattle and and hopefully a good draw in deer season and um it's just uh great you know to have moisture and have that you know, just excitement to be looking forward to those bucks. And I know you and your team are just um, anxious and to, to get going and get this thing kicked off. Uh, I encourage anyone out there interested in a deer hunt on the Arizona Strip to give Clay a call. Before we go, though, I also want to touch on bighorn sheep. Um, okay. Living up in that country there, you cover 13B, 13A, um, talk a little bit about uh the units that you cover there for sheep okay you know 13b is divided in half there's 13b north and 13b south 13b north has uh three tags in it um 
and 13B South only has one, so non-residents don't waste putting in for that. Uh, but the, the 13B North, a non-resident could draw. Uh, you know, 13B North has uh, more sheep in it. Uh, 13B North also borders Utah, and so the sheep go back and forth, and some of them get shot in Utah. So they, so there, it's really there's more than three sheep get killed out of there every year, and so I think it's kind of the class is down a little bit. Uh, a big sheep can show up there though anytime. 13B South has an extra 15 days. You can start uh, November 15th or 16th on it. Uh, through to December 31st. It's a 13, 13B South is a big, long stretch, you know, probably a 20 mile stretch of a little shelf that the sheep are on. And uh, there's two or three or four wildlife catchments on that uh, little stretch. Uh, it's hard to see all the sheep on that unit because it's so far and, and, and so remote. Um, the 13 B South used to be the best unit. Uh, then 13 B was better for a lot of years. Um, and then, uh, I don't know this year we got, we got lucky and, uh, killed a pretty good ram in there. And, uh, I, I don't know whether he just showed up. Uh, so 13B South is not very far from the Nevada line, which you've got Gold Butte in Nevada there that has sheep on it. Sheep can go back and forth pretty easy there. Uh, and again, it's just so remote and, and they're so spread out. A big sheep can show up there anytime, I feel. Uh, then you get on 13A, you have, uh, 13A, 13, or, yeah, no, 12A, 12B, and 13A are one unit, which there's one sheep, and then... Is that a tough, is that a tough, um, is that tough to find sheep there? Uh... Or is it a pretty good hunt? It's not a bad hunt, actually. Okay. Uh, you... There's a lot of roads that drive right to the edge of Canab Creek, Hacks Canyon, where you can uh, glass from, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So it's not as hard to get to. And then the other one is the uh, Cottonwood uh, Wilderness Area, which gives one tag. Uh, How's that one? You know, I think it would probably be the best one to draw, actually. Them sheep, some of them Zion sheep come into there. There's been uh, there's some good sheep in there, as far as quality. Not a lot of sheep, but quality. Okay. Do you mess with the 12B East hunts at all on the Pariah or no? On the Pariah, yeah. um, no. There's I I haven't I I. They give three tag. They have an early hunt, a late hunt. They give three in the early and four in the late. Uh, I know where the sheep are. I mean, I I do cameras over there, uh, but I haven't actually taken a hunter there. Okay. Speaking of that, um, you typically take one at least one try to take one sheep hunter a year right and sometimes two yeah we yeah i'd like to take two because i like i'd like to hunt both uh both these 13b units okay but we you know i've got the help that we can take more than that uh it's just there's not not many <laughs> not many tags to take you know sure uh, sure well i know you guys had a heck of a hunt last year and um, it's always great seeing your success. Um, buddy, I look forward to chatting with you as the summer progresses and get a little update on these deer. 
uh, and and see how things are shaping up. And you know, we're just all sitting there hoping that we have an early monsoon and and just things just continue to get better and better and better. And um, it's just a you know anticipation is high and it's it's a fun time of year. You know, everyone's expectations and excitement level is super high anticipating the coming fall and especially with all this mess and chaos we've had with this coronavirus and stuff i know there's a lot of people out there that are just dreaming of better days so um thanks for coming on and sharing with us it's always great having you on and um you're all you're a good friend and you're always uh very gracious with your time so i want to thank you for that thank you and uh I want to sh- say the same thing. I've, I've learned a lot from you, and I appreciate your knowledge and uh, and your help. Right on. How is the best way for people to get a hold of you, Clay? Well, I'm, I'm on Instagram, Clay Bundy Outfitters. Uh, you can talk to me there, or my phone number, 435-680-2991. Uh, I'm a little better at talking than I am... Uh, on the other texting social media but uh or i think i am maybe i'm not (laughs) Uh, well buddy thanks for coming on i encourage everyone to check out clay's instagram it's awesome clay bundy outfitters uh on there and uh, give clay a call if you got questions about the draw um great wealth of of knowledge there and and a lot of history And I just appreciate all you do, Clay. So I look forward to talking to you later in the summer, okay? Thank you very much. All right, buddy. God bless. Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye.